what we'll do, we're going to have just kind of a uh, roundtable discussion format. I'll have some questions for these gentlemen and to get the conversation going. And then if any of the audience members have some questions, we'll open that up in a little bit for, for discussion if you want to field any topics that you want these gentlemen to discuss for you. First, introduce myself. Like Max said, my name is Matt Amon. I'm with ATBS. We're out of Denver, Colorado. We're in that uh, really admirable business of doing tax and accounting work. So what we do is we specialize. We work specifically with uh, owner operators and small fleets all over the country, tens of thousands of uh, owner operators all over the country, helping manage the bookkeeping, accounting, uh, and quarterly tax estimates, year-end state and federal taxes for them. And so at the end of the day, who we are, we do a lot of consulting with drivers, and we've got one of the largest repositories on data and analytics about what's going on real time in the industry. And so it's fun for us to be able to come together, be able to, to host a session like this, be able to talk with experts like these who are out doing it every single day. So let me give you a little bit, little more introduction to uh, who our panelists are today. So sitting immediately next to me, uh, is Les Willis. Les is a Navy vet. He owns Godspeed Expeditors and runs four temperature controlled straight trucks, which he's had leased to FedEx Custom Critical since 2005. Les got his start in the trucking as a driver in 1985. Uh, Les doesn't drive full time anymore, but he drives when a truck is sitting. Les is a member of the Trucking Solutions Group and on the board of St. Christopher's Fund. Les told me there's <laughs> There's no one of us smarter than all of us, which makes him the perfect panelist to have with us today. Also, Les is running everything out in the parking lot where the truck parking is going on. There's a major event going on out there for, with St. Christopher's Fund, so it'd be great to go out, see them, some of the things that are going on out there as well. Henry Albert, sitting in the middle. Henry's been a Freightliner Team Run Smart Pro since 2007. He owns Albert Transport and oper operates on his own authority. Henry started driving in 1983 and has been operating on his own authority since 1996. He was Overdrive's owner operator of the year in 2007. Henry is on the board of Trucker Buddy and is the chairman of the Trucking Solutions Group. Henry is an expert at maximizing fuel economy. He's recently been testing the limits to maximize time, speed, and fuel efficiency with his 7010 project to consistently get over 10 miles per gallon while driving at posted highway speeds of 70 or more miles per hour. On the end here, we have Jimmy Neverez. Jimmy is also a Navy vet. He's been a Team Run Smart Pro since 2012. He has a bachelor's degree in business and graduated magna cum laude. He owns Angus Transport and operates four trucks on his own authority. Jimmy started driving in 2002. He became an owner operator in 2010 and stopped, started operating on his own authority in 2015. Jimmy bought his second truck in 2016 and now operates a fleet of four trucks. He plans to continue growing this fleet. Jimmy is also a member of the Trucking Solutions Group. Jimmy has created a successful niche operating local and super regional in Southern California, a market that most fleets shy away from. Jimmy has experience operating both diesel and alternative fuel trucks. So with that, gentlemen, thank you for coming in today. So what we're gonna talk about is finding freight and managing cash flow. We've got different experts, one who's leased on to a, a fleet operating under their authority, two that are operating on their own authority, two of the gentlemen who have multiple trucks, one of the gentlemen who's a, a true owner operator driving his own truck full time. So as we go through some of the, the questions we wanted to talk about uh, in terms of freight and customers. So first, as an owner operator or fleet, having good customers is the lifeblood of your business. Tell us a little bit about how you find, rank, and manage customers. And Les, why don't we, we'll jump to Henry first, because we'll come back to you, because it's a little different in a leased operation than when you're leased onto a fleet than it is. And so we'll let Henry talk about uh, how is a single truck operator, how he manages his customers and finds freight first? Well, the majority of my freight has always been direct with the customer. I've had very little brokered freight over my career. Uh, part of the key to finding that was I mainly at the beginning concentrated on just two cities and found freight that ran between them. It was a, at the time it was a 50 mile radius of Charlotte and a 50 mile radius of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Going to Philadelphia, nobody wanted to go there from the Carolinas, so you could charge going that way. But 
you were able to develop relationships directly with the customer, and through doing that, cut out all the middlemen and developed relationships and had an A. The hardest thing, we were talking about this at lunch today, was you had to have an A and a B and a C set of customers. And the hardest thing to do was to keep hauling freight for what you called your C customers when the A's were busy. But you never knew when something would happen to one of the A's and a C could suddenly become a B or a C could become an A. So keeping yep. your lesser customers happy when your real good paying ones are busy, that was always hard to do. Yeah. How about Jimmy running a super regional operation in a really difficult market? So when it comes to finding customers for me, I'll be honest, when I, when I got my first truck, I was kind of thrown into the mix of being an owner operator without a single customer or broker even in my back pocket. So, you know, we, I, I ended up going out on my own and buying my first truck as a result of the company I was with for many years getting sold um, and then decided to take that jumping off point and, and take what cash I had and, and cash it out and get into my own first truck. So. Being digitally inclined, uh, I ended up always spending a lot of time researching and finding things online. So I figured, well, maybe I'll just go about and do it that way. So subscribe to a couple load board apps, use some of the new digital ones that are now blossoming that were just in their infancy at the time to develop a rapport with those brokers that I did some of those first loads with, uh, knew the lanes, knew the rates by research, uh, started to take it from there and just build a reputation for delivering on promise, uh, learning my scheduling tactics, being able to get those loads right in the key parts of where they need to be during a work day, uh, having the reputation for always delivering and doing what they want, communication. Those brokers now come back to me and give me first choice on a lot of those loads that I want before anybody else, before they ever hit a load board, um, just because of the reputation I had built. So 70% of our work now comes from, versus no brokerage contacts in the beginning, 70% of our stuff that we get is given to us first dibs before anyone else even has a chance based on that reputation. Then we fill the rest of it in with uh, mostly digital apps for, for the spot freight. So then, Les, your business model is totally different. Your primary customer is FedEx, but at the end of the day, you still have to take care of FedEx's customer. Are there certain things you have to do to keep your Ford trucks productive that you're mindful in terms of lanes that you're focusing that equipment on or different things that you're doing to, to keep those trucks productive within the FedEx cycle? Yeah, as far as uh, being leased to a carrier and the way that they dispatch their loads out. Every carrier is going to have their different SOPs that that they uh, adopt and, and that we have to adhere to. But the thing is, is that you find your niche and you find your lanes, and you're very well educated because you can actually see how the freight uh, moves within the within those lanes. What's profitable one way may not be profitable the other way. But so. You kind of watch that and you always see those different loads popping up on different load boards. You'll also see that they, we don't have a forced dispatch, so some of our dispatch uh, loads actually come across our Qualcomm units. And then we have the opportunity whether we want to uh, accept a load or refuse a load, or we can send it back and say, well, it's not enough money. So sometimes in that uh, scenario, you always take your backhaul with you. So if it's going to take you to a, a, a bad area, take your backhaul with you. So if you're going to take a load and you say, well, I'm going to Montana and it's paying me $2 a mile to get there. Well, if you got to do that all the way back, you didn't make but a dollar a mile. So you actually went in the hole. So, uh, I operate very specialized equipment so my break even cost is somewhere around a buck 65 a mile so the freight that i haul has to pay really really well or you know i'm going out of business so and it works great for my drivers because my drivers they're on a percentage based pay so as far as that goes i mean they do really really well but uh, we don't run a lot but when we do run we get paid very well for what we do yeah so 
You both are running dry van equipment in your operations. Les, you're running expedited equipment, so your average, you're close to $300,000 a truck once you've got one specced out and built up, right? So you've got a, a lot higher daily fixed cost of operation in your business, and so you gotta always be mindful of making sure you're maximizing the productivity on those lanes, and like you're talking about, you have but since you have a specialized equipment, you can't just go pick up a you know 53 foot trailer and take off with it the other direction. You got to be mindful of those backhauls, or you'll kill yourself on the, the fixed cost while you're sitting around waiting for that next load. There's I, my deal is is there's no such thing as deadhead in my game. I'm an all miles type of guy. For every mile that my truck goes down the road, I want to be paid. I want my drivers to be paid. I don't expect my drivers to get out there and run up and down the road for free. And I'm not going to run my business the same way. So for every mile that my truck goes down the road, I have to have a return on my investment in that truck. So my, my investment in my trucks is approaching $280,000. So what you guys would say, okay, well, I've got, you know, my truck, I paid $150,000, $160,000 for it brand new freight liner, what are they, about 150, 160, right, and 170, 180? You can go higher, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but <clears throat> we're very, very specialized, so the stuff that we do, you know, we, I mean, we've hauled anything from Elvis Presley's Harley Davidson to his acoustic guitar to Picasso's to uh, anything that you can think of as high value, um, high target markets. Um, that, that we do, and it very, very specialized on what we do. So we don't run hard, but uh, we get paid very, very well for what we do. Yep, so you so gotta run smart. You, you gotta, gotta be run very, run very smart. smart. And I always tell all my drivers, and, and I don't know if we got fleet owners in here or whatever, but um, you're only as good as your next load. So if you always remember that, always be thinking ahead. It, and that's the way we do our stuff, you know. And then what's working for us in January, February, and March is not necessarily gonna work for us in April, May, and June. So yep. <clears throat> understanding how the freight lanes work, uh, the markets in general, and the lanes that uh, will tell you where you need to be. And it's basically placing your assets w where they need to be. Yep. So I, yeah, that's a great segue to something else we were talking about at lunch earlier today. And that's how Jimmy and Henry, you guys both kind of focus differently also. You're focused in a 50 mile radius of a couple of cities. Cause that's the only way you can, as an individual guy, really know your freight rates and what's going on in those markets. You can't go, go all over. But then Jimmy, you're super regional. And so you're really looking at, you know, Southern California and Vegas, which is, you know, a really condensed area where, what's your average length of haul, Henry? You're well, right now it's longer than when I started. It's Laredo to Charlotte's my main haul. Yeah, so you're, you're in a couple regions, you know those markets extremely well, and Jimmy, you're running an area that's probably a quarter of that size, and you gotta know those markets extremely well. So. Yeah. How does that lay into knowing A, B, and C type customers in, in each one of those markets? You develop your A's and your B's. You're always trying to develop the next A, yeah. obviously. Um, what would you call an A customer versus a C customer? What, an what A customer you... is nice facilities, loads quick, pays good, and pays quickly. And in this day and age with ELDs, loading and unloading is probably a priority, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, so. yeah, especially especially in the local stuff we do, time is money uh, more than ever. So if it's not quick and it's not fast, it's just eating away at, at any other potential revenue you could have had landing another load that day. Yeah, so even if you have somebody that pays higher per mile, you got to calculate that cost of time in there to, to see if that's really a premier customer or not. What were you well, although with the same conversation we were having at lunch, for enough money, they can have my truck all week at one place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is more so your business that's model. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You know, uh, he's in a, a regional basis. He's on a dedicated, my trucks are 48 states in Canada. Um, all three of us would haul a load to the moon and back if it paid well. So just, uh, you know, um, yep. just understand that. It's all about the pay. And it's not about the, the miles, and, and, you know. 
oh, the more miles I get, you know, the cheaper I can run. Not necessarily because there's only such amount of, uh, a number of miles in your truck. So until you have to replace it. So I always look at my replacement costs. What's it going to cost me to replace that truck? And I figure how many miles am I actually going to get out of my unit before it's time to get rid of it? Yep. Where you're probably trading at real low miles and these guys are getting up 500,000, close to 500,000 miles before they're Yes, I, I've looked at that, you know. The thing is, is that what my, my trucks are designed, a Class 8 truck designed to carry, you know, 80,000 pounds gross everywhere we go. But we're, we're not that. We, we carry, our, I think our average load is 2,500 pounds. So where he's struggling over here to, to get his 10 miles per per gallon, which is just makes me look stupid, but um, when we're knocking 11.2 miles per gallon out of our units, it's what we're yeah. getting. Uh, and that's a consistent, that very consistent. And that's with a driver. Certainly if I owned it and I was out there driving, my fuel mileage would be a lot better than what my drivers are giving me. Yeah. But uh, Henry is just kind of the king on that. But that's such a huge, huge cost. Yeah, and, and that's where you can make the big, big difference in your bottom line is that fuel pump at yep. the pump. So that's a, that's a huge, huge deal. Yep. But, well, it's nice having your fuel cost down around 26 cents a mile. Yeah. yeah. Matt, with what we were talking about, it reminded me of a conversation when I was getting ready to start on my own. And there was a friend of mine that had 89 trucks. And I looked up to him. And I had done all my business plans and I had all my cost per mile all figured down to the nitty gritty. And I got to talking to him about determining freight rates because I wasn't planning on dealing with brokers, nor did I hardly. And I said to him, how do you determine what a freight rate is? And he said, and I'll never forget it was a coffee. He didn't give me the answer then. He told me to think about it for a week. He says, the first thing I want to tell you is your freight rates have absolutely nothing to do with the operating cost of the truck which threw me for a loop for the better part of the week. But if you're in a place where it's paying $5 a mile, it's supply and demand. Yep. And I use, but you can go to a place where there's only one load and a thousand trucks are looking for that one load, it's going for nothing. But sometimes if you get that one load, it's 100% profit because you got the big money going in because you knew your market. And I used to have the hardest problems when I was a flatbed carrier with my owner operators, it's, well, I'm not hauling that cheap freight, I just want to go back. Well, that was pure profit money they just left sitting there. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to understand that sometimes. You know, in our, at ATBS, I know a lot of times our business consultants are talking with drivers who, you know, they're not making money and they're not making money and they became an owner operator because they wanted to be able to turn down freight. It's like, you got to understand, you know, you got fixed costs. Every single day at midnight, you're writing another check whether you're driving or not. And so if you're not ready to write that check because you don't like the freight rate coming out, you're better off running at a loss out of a lot of markets, but you gotta understand, take your backhaul with you. If you're gonna take a cheap freight into a market, you better know how you're gonna get paid while getting out of that market. Yeah, see that bodes into what we do really well because a lot of what we do on the local super regional is You'll find times we're deadheading out from where we just unloaded the entire length or longer of the haul. So it's, it's not so much figured out as deadheading is a bad thing for us. If you've got enough time to go back and grab that next one, take it right back the next day. Sometimes we've calculated the numbers out to where we run to Vegas better off to come back empty to be able to make that round trip in a day than to bring something back because of the rates coming back. And that's how I built a big model doing my Vegas runs. Well, and I think that also goes into one of the really interesting things you've been working on, Henry, and that's the Project 7010, where you're trying to average over 70 miles per hour and remain over 10 miles per gallon in your truck. And I think what's even more interesting about that is that the savings you've found has been in time. You well, know, not only are you keeping your cost of fuel extremely low, but you've bought an extra day to either create more profit or be able to give yourself a better lifestyle, be able to get home more often because you've found this additional day out of the week by running that truck smart. It, it's been amazing 
people that know me, I've been chasing fuel mileage for a while. I was doing the 62 to 65. I even did a month long of testing at 55. And with everything I'd done with the truck, I hadn't looked at getting in a hurry. Well, as it turned out, I got behind and I had to get in a hurry and kick it up to 75 in Texas. And I was like, hey, hold on, this thing isn't doing too bad. Wasn't doing the 10s that I was used to. I wasn't hitting the 11s. But for the last 253,000 miles playing around with that way, it's still just shy of 9.6 miles of the gallon. Now, Say on the time. 253,000 miles? It's 19.7% 19, 19. I think of the time it has been above 71 mile an hour for those miles, which is. I mean, that's incredible. I'm killing a lot of boats. <laughs> so, what, how I picked up the time on my run to Charlotte the first day in just under 11 hours, I can knock down 720 miles. Then I can knock out the rest in the next day. They're unloading and loading me during my 10 hours. I'm skipping a 10 hour break on each end where before you'd come up a couple hours short and it'd throw another 10 hour break. So I'm picking up 24 to 28 hours, not purely on the speed, but because you're skipping two pit stops. And I used to race. If you can skip one pit stop, nobody's catching you. You yeah. skip two, you won the race and the championship. <laughs> yeah. But it's costing me $60 extra in fuel a week because when you get to the higher numbers, if you go from 10 to 9.5, it's not like going from 6 to 6.5 or vice versa. Yeah. Now, that makes me think, you know, we want to talk a little bit about cash flow management as well. Um, and I want to thank, you know, our partner TBS with, with Partners in Business, the sponsor of uh, partners in business, and we'll talk a little bit about factoring. But before we even get to factoring and some of the interesting conversations we had around that, Les, I want to ask you about how you manage the reserve accounts in your business. Because we were talking about maintenance and repairs, and you know, one of the, the keys to managing a successful business is you always have to have the cash set aside because you're going to have the unplanned emergency. I don't care how well you've tried to figure out your operating costs and what you've done. At some point, something's gonna blow up, something's gonna go wrong. And if you're not ready for that, you're gonna be out of business. And so you had a really interesting concept with how you look at maintenance and repairs and you're running multiple trucks in your fleet. Can you touch on that a little? Yeah, um, a lot of people, when you do your books or when you file your, your um, expenses out, nobody always says maintenance and repairs. Well, in my business, maintenance and repairs each have their own category so I can better track what is a maintenance cost and what is a repair cost. Am I eating, getting eaten up with repair costs? Because in that account, when I look at that account and I start seeing that repair um, amount in that repair account start dwindling down, that throws a red flag up to me. So I can better track and see um, do I need to get rid of this truck? Is this, a, am I you know, getting a return on my money? You're always going to have your fixed costs over your maintenance if, if you're on a maintenance program, you know? But man, don't, never rob the truck of its money and never rob the truck of its maintenance because one day it'll look at you and say, screw you, I'm not going nowhere. And, and that's how you feed your family. That's how you make your living. And next thing you know, you're up out of business. It, and I'm over there buying your stuff up for pennies on a dollar. So uh, be smart about what you do. Uh, track your costs. I mean, it's so important. You just got it. The more you can track, the better off you are. Um, and be able to identify where the hiccup is actually coming from. It's, that's the way we do it. And I've never robbed the truck of the truck's money. You start robbing the truck and next thing you know, I mean, I see it all the time. I, you guys probably do, do too, you know. Guys, man, I just bought me a new truck. I'm going out here, I got a new house, got the new flashy boat out in the front yard. And, you know, and you're going like, my God, man, maybe I need to go work for this guy. Well, wait about a year and you'll go by there and buy his house and you'll buy his car and buy his boat from him for pennies on the dollar. Just be smart about what you're doing and never rob your truck of your truck's money. So yeah. that's the way we do it. And just make sure that you track, 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 track. Know what your maintenance costs are, know what your repair costs are, know what your overhead are, uh, know what your fixed costs. I mean, 
they continue on. Whether that truck rolls up and down the road or not, it still continues on. But uh, we track that, uh, that maintenance and repair, and we break both of those out so that we can uh, very well, because if I, next thing you know, well, well, I just had to put a water pump on. Well, the air dryer just went out. Well, what did it cost me for an air dryer? Most people were sort of like, well, that's 600 bucks. Well, you didn't figure that 400 some odd dollars that you had to pay for the roadside uh, guys to come out there. God bless TA and Petro, right? <laughs> they picked my butt up off the side of the road many a times, but they didn't do it for free. I promise you that. So, um, but yeah, the, those are um, costs that you're not, uh, your unexpected costs. They're coming, and it doesn't matter what you do, however you do it. It don't matter if you buy a used truck, if you buy a new truck, or whatever. Those costs are coming, so you better be prepared. Um, I think uh, my good friend right here sitting in the front row, Mr. Bob Caffey, <laughs> said if you ever want to make a million dollars in truck, and start with two. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, that's just one of those things. You just prepare, you know? And uh, network, my God, pick the phone up, call somebody. If you don't know anybody, call somebody. I mean, get out, network. Go. I mean, just being here um, shows your will to uh, have a better understanding of your of your business. And it's because there's no one of us up here smarter than all of us out there. No. So, network. Get to know uh, what people are doing. You know, I go all around all the time and um, go to different listening sessions because I'm interested in what you're doing just as much as you're interested in what I'm doing because I may not have thought of that. So um, it's just networking like that. Shoot, sometimes that happens on the phone. I've gotten yeah. calls from you and you've gotten them from me. Yeah. Can I add on that maintenance? Yes, because sir. with the newer trucks, and each year since going way back, I mean, it used to be a big deal that you could get to 500,000 without rebuilding an engine. Yeah. Then a million came. And oils have gotten better. The engines have gotten better. And as much as I say don't underdo maintenance, I also meet a lot of people that overdo maintenance. Like the truck I'm driving now, if you're above seven miles of the gallon, the factory recommended oil change on FA4 oil is 75,000 miles. Well, I meet people that are changing it every 10,000 yet. That's not taking advantage of the technology that's within that truck. Yeah. And probably the funniest one on the maintenance item, I used to just replace my air filter on the engine every six months. Why? Because when I looked at it, it was dirty. Well, I got to talking, it was at one of these shows, and I was talking to an air filter manufacturer whose job is to sell me air filters. And he says, well, where in the world are you running? Because you're changing it way too often. And I said, he says, go by your restriction gauge. You can't tell looking at it. And he also shared with me, one of the worst things you can do to an engine is, from that side, is put a brand new air filter on. Because the pores are the biggest when they're brand new. The dirtier they get, the better they filter. Hmm. Which went backwards to all my thoughts. So now I go by the restriction gauge and my fuel mileage, nothing changed. I've gotten over 250,000 miles out of an air filter now that I was just throwing money. Yep, yep, excellent point. And, and one thing I say along those lines is make sure you don't just do the standard oil change service. Pay attention to the other maintenance on your trucks that you have to do. Guys will overlook, well, I should say people, uh, men and women, both overlook the issue of, you know, 100,000 miles down the road on a new truck, you still need to do a valve lashing valve adjustment. You got to do these things that aren't just your standard oil change service that, that are recommended by your manufacturer on the trucks. Uh, the other thing is when you multiply trucks, you multiply costs. Uh, I track everything on spreadsheets being a business major. Uh, spreadsheets are my best friend. We list everything out that we've paid for and nobody in the world told me and should have told me, I should have assumed that it, Tires multiply like rabbits when you add trucks. And, and my maintenance on tires, you know, just adding a truck at a time, it just like exponentially starts to get worse. Uh, make, sure, make sure you're on top of stuff like that. Uh, tires can wear out and you won't even know about it. You'll have a guy running down the road with bald tires. Uh, and keep track of that. Try to keep good network of service 
centers. Uh, being local, regional, we have a lot of the same places we go for tires and our services. Uh, really good relation with them. So if you run a regular route, you run regular stuff, make sure you know the service points along that area. It can help you out with road service too because then you'll know the places that aren't going to rip you off for coming out and taking care of a tire or coming out and taking care of something on the road. They're actually going to be fair about coming out and charging you if you know them and utilize them regularly. So. Those, those are some key insights as you start to multiply trucks if you look at doing that as well. So, Jimmy, I'm going to ask you a question kind of out of left field, and I'll stage the question first, give you guys a little bit of background of where I'm coming from. But talking about tracking expenses and those types of things and the importance of keeping all that information. So we mentioned Henry and Jimmy are both uh, Team Run Smart pros. So Team Run Smart is a partnership between Freightliner and ATBS. And, it's a, a community geared towards the career of truck driving. It's you know talking about all the great things about driving, helping people understand how to manage their business, those types of things. Um, and so one of the benefits of being a Team Run Smart Pro, we have five pros, Bob down in the front row that Les mentioned a little bit ago, he and his wife are also uh, part of the Team Run Smart Pro group, but they get to drive the latest, greatest technology that Freightliner is coming out with and go out and use it in the real world, running their businesses, and figure out the way to couple the technology and the truck and the business together and figure out the best ways to, to earn the greatest profits in their businesses by leveraging that technology. So one of the interesting things we had going on with Jimmy a couple of years ago is you were running a natural gas truck out in California how important, I mean, that was kind of like completely out of left field for most people to think about, okay, I understand my operating costs on diesel fuel and, you know, tires and oil changes and all these things, and all of a sudden you got a completely different fuel that <laughs> you're burning, maintenance and PMs and all those things, all those variables change. How do you track a different variable like that coming into your business. So those different variables, it, uh, when I first started, I've had two CNG trucks in my in my fleet, and it's a whole separate set of spreadsheets, a whole separate set of calculations. You have to approach from just a complete opposite end. You have to track costs at a at an equivalent. So all your fuel costs are then tracked by by a CNG, which was at that point a diesel gallon equivalent, DGE. Uh, tracking fuel costs, monitoring the fluctuation, the comparisons to the diesel trucks, uh, making sure that when you're running on the natural gas that you are still remaining just as profitable or more profitable than the diesel, that you weren't going to be upside down. Should the diesel costs come down far enough, you could end up upside down with CNG. So it's, it's with oil being a volatile uh, commodity, you would see fluctuations in diesel fuel that you would not see in natural gas. So you had to pay attention to those things. And when you're running both kinds of fuels in your fleet, that's just that much more tracking you have to do to be able to make sure you remain profitable. And so that, you know, the interesting story to me with that is if you didn't know your expenses, didn't understand every penny in your business well before we threw that variable at you, you'd have never been able to figure out after that point. Very easily, because you even run into issues of uh, the, the, the cycle of maintenance costs are different than a diesel truck, so you can actually chart them out to where on a diesel truck, it ramps up at a different volume for maintenance costs in general as a whole for the truck. It ramps up at a different volume and rate than a CNG truck. So as where you have a chart on diesel that's going to be lower maintenance costs on the newer end when the truck's new and then as the diesel truck gets older you're going to have more increased costs you end up actually climbing faster on a cng trucks front end when it's brand new the costs are more because you have a uh, higher cost of oil changes and higher costs of of the maintenance itself just the oil change service is more expensive so you, you have to track those in comparison and, and compare charts on that stuff as well okay so uh, sorry, were you in I'm waiting for Jimmy to get an electric truck. If anybody can make it work, it'd be Jimmy. I'm game. <laughs> you drove one, didn't you? Yeah, so I did get to drive the new E-Cascadia from Freightliner, and uh, just after experiencing that, I'm, 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 on, I'm, I'm definitely interested in what has to come. Uh, it's been in the media lately, so they're actually starting to put those in some hands, and um, I'm... If I'm approached with that option, I'd, I'd be willing to track costs on something like that and try it out as well. Great. 
Well, I want to try and be a little mindful of our time here um, so we can open up to some questions. But the last thing I want to get into before we start opening it up is factoring and talk about how each of you manage cash flow in your business. And that, you know, again, Les, you're leased on with the fleet, so you're kind of using that fleet almost as your factor. Henry, I think you had a, you know, really interesting conversation earlier about how you had reserves in your business and you kind of ran out of those while you were waiting for your authority and things to get wrapped up and you had to end up raising capital through credit cards and then Jimmy, you've got a completely different model in terms of why you turn towards factoring and you use factoring in your business as a, a competitive advantage, a way to lower your cost. And so I guess, Henry, go ahead. Why don't you start? Because you have the, the interesting story. Well, when I started out, I did a lot of planning. For two years, before I even looked at a truck, I was running a small fleet for a private carrier, drove one of them, tracked the cost on all that. I had everything. Plan A, B, and C. Had it all lined up. Bought the truck. Got my insurance. Had my own authority. And when I had the authority lined up, they said, as soon as you put the insurance on, we'll activate your authority. So here I am, I left my job, brand new truck, brand new trailer sitting in the driveway, had sold almost everything I had to get started, had enough reserve there that I thought, I'm taking a chance, but I'm gonna be okay. And the government didn't give me my authority for a little over a month. They got to know me, I called them every day. <laughs> it ate up all my reserves, and I still remember, I, my first load canceled on me. This wasn't a good start. I didn't plan on jumping off a cliff and building a parachute, it found me. But anyway, my first load canceled on me, I had a brand new flatbed, and with my, that was a brokered load, but I had already had a return load from a customer direct. And I sat around all day, sat around, sat around, kept waiting for a load to show up, got towards the end of the day and I'm like, I am not canceling on my first load for my own direct customer. It was rainy, it was in September, it was half chilly. I left Charlotte and I kept looking in my mirror at my empty flatbed all the way to Philadelphia saying, what the heck have I done? <laughs> and when I got there to pick up in the morning, I got there, got to sleep and they came in and I went in and introduced myself to the loading crew. I knew some other people there from making the deal. And they said, wow, you're here early. And I said, I wish I was here early. They said about getting unloaded, I said, you were supposed to be the second load on this trailer, you're the first. I explained to them what happened, and they said, well, you could have called us, we could have found somebody else to haul that load. I said, no, that'll happen someday, but it'll be because I could not help it. That ended up paying off dividends. But I still remember getting out, I still carry the Discover card, the Discover card, it's not in use anymore that I put the first fuel in that truck and took everything to the negative to go up there after using up my reserves trying to survive the first month without driving the truck. And I ended up having like 60 some thousand dollars worth of credit cards that I was rotating 0%, 2%. I'd run one halfway up, take the next one down. I never ended up paying much interest, but there wasn't all the factoring services and all that back then and finally cycled out ahead of it and. Now everybody wants to loan me money and I don't need it. <laughs> That's typically how it works. So <laughs> yes. Then Jimmy, you're a completely different model where you know, you've know you looked at, you leverage the services with TBS and look at them as a, a partner for your business to help manage your operational costs. Yeah, so as we increased um, and I started adding trucks, the, the main thing was we do a different niche market so instead of doing maybe two or three invoices a week per truck we're doing two or three invoices a day per truck so when you start to multiply that up by truck it becomes a lot of invoicing it becomes a lot of paperwork and back office tedious on top of I still drive one of my own trucks so after I'm done driving a whole shift to Vegas and back last thing I want to do is go in my office and spend hours invoicing, hunting down non-payments, hunting down payments, you know. Uh, so, so I ended up turning to uh, factoring and, and I was actually part of another factoring company that luckily was bought out by TBS Factoring and, and it's worked out great. They've, they've actually been really good about 
providing me a service level that's not just saying, okay, we'll pay you for your freight invoices, and if I need help, you know, go go find it on your own. There, it's it's a complete back office for me. So it provides for me at a fraction of the cost of having to hire someone to be my back office, having a full non-recourse agreement with them to be able to submit the invoice, submit the bill of lading, submit any rate contracts I have with the customer or broker, and get paid immediately on it compared to having to have a back office and, and hire a full-time employee just for that specific job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing we were talking about earlier that I love about that is at ATBS, you know, we'll take a guy from single sole proprietor or owner operator driving his own truck and help them to where they grow a small fleet and start building that fleet. And we typically tell them we can handle you, you know, that sweet spot's kind of like five to 15 trucks somewhere in there that you need somebody on site doing all the day-to-day -day bookkeeping, make, keeping all your records, making sure you've got the costs under control, the bills being paid. And it, that happens somewhere in that spot. And that's the point where we, we say, you know, you're not a good fit for us anymore. You need to find somebody who's on staff all day doing these things for you. You're doing the same thing with the factoring. Company. Yeah, and it will reach that point when I do reach the point when I'm going to get out of a truck full-time for myself, mm -hmm. that I'll be you know, either that full-time employee or I'll reach the point where I have to hire somebody. But until then, it's nice that I sat in with TBS and had the right service to provide that service level I need because since I was able to experience another factoring company, it's, uh, it's been to where I know they're not all created equal. So finding the right one to work with you and, and, and actually take care of you when you need help is, is one of the important things to consider if you ever consider factoring. Yep. Now, Les, you're kind of totally different. So you're leased onto a fleet, and you and I were talking last week about how really that fleet is the factor for you. You know, one of the reasons you've decided to operate under that fleet is you don't have to manage the customer relationships as closely as these two do. You don't have to worry about the billing. You don't have to worry about the collections and all those things. The fleet's doing that for you but you're turning around paying a similar type of cost in the freight rate of what the fleet's taken to, to manage that overhead for you. So one of the other interesting things I think you and I talked about last week is the relationship with a banker and just how important that is in your business and making sure you have a, a good banker on your team that really understands your business and what you're doing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um that's probably one of the top three keys to the success of your business is your banker. You know, if you don't have a banker that doesn't, that uh, understands your business, um, you're in a world of hurt. And it's up to you to make sure that your banker understands your business. Because if you go in there and you say, hey man, I need a loan for $300,000. And he looks and he says, what for? Um, well, you know, I'd like to buy a truck. He says, well, you know, I got 20 sitting out here in my parking lot. What makes you so special? You know, so make sure that your banker understands your business, that uh, he knows your ins and outs, how, how well you perform, you know. Um, I always look at my business and I, I have a great relationship with my CPA. So he does a lot of tracking for me and a lot of analysis. Uh, one, one of the things that we look to is uh, to see how our business is actually doing. Uh, so we look at it in a bit of formula. So that's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So look at that and that'll tell you exactly what your business is actually worth. You know, as you start growing your business and you start in increasing your sales and um, you track that because that'll actually tell you, yeah, you're, you're doing really, really good. And um, so at the end of the year, you're sort of like, okay, if I sold my business today, because everybody wants to go fishing, right? I don't know anybody in here that doesn't want to go fishing. And I see them on the banks of the creek all day long. When I pass overhead, I'm like, man, I need that job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just uh, make things sure that you, you keep those relationships and uh, open with your CPA and um, also with your banker, but make dang sure your banker understands your business. I can call my banker today and say, hey, I'd like to buy a truck. He'll say, how much is it? Where is it at? And when will you be in to sign the papers? But you leverage each one of your creditors or, or your lenders. You leverage that 
against your lenders. So you say, hey, well, you know, I called Daimler. Daimler's going to give me six and a half percent interest. Can you can you can you match it? Well, I can get you at six point five, or I'm, I can get you at six point seven five. I'm going to pay that 025 percent just to establish that relationship with my banker and make it that much deeper. Because I can always go to Daimler or somebody else and, and, and get a loan that way. But I diversify on my lenders. My lenders are very diversified. So I may be at Wells Fargo with this truck, I may be at Daimler with this truck, and I may be at my local bank with this truck. <clears throat> but I always have that ace in the hole with my local banker. He is my ace in my hole. So that's the way that I've got my stuff set up. Yep. Excellent. So, again, being mindful of time, and we want to be able to open this up to questions. We'll, we'll open that up now. Does anybody have a question? If so, we've got Max with the mic. Just raise your hand. And Matt, let me point one thing out. Uh, we're talking about factoring and financial services and TBS being a sponsor. Jennifer Lichtig, the head of TBS, is here. Uh, Jennifer? Uh, she, she'd love to talk to you after the session if you have questions about factoring or TBS or anything. Do you want to say anything else, Jennifer? say thank you and thank you are you one of my clients yes I am <laughs> I did not know that and you taught me some things so I appreciate your time up there and all of you and the important topic that you're covering today certainly great Jennifer, thank you thanks so for making back this to the, possible sure any back questions, questions. Any? Uh, so this is kind of like a two-part question but um, how would you guys go on about uh, retaining drivers and if you don't have any drivers, how do you like attract them? What was that? Recruiting drivers? Retention Recruiting. and attraction. Is that where your question was, sir? Yeah. Oh, wow. You retain them by paying them. I keep trying to fire my driver. Yeah. Well, I've tried to fire a couple of mine and that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But man, just treat them like, treat them like they're gold. Here's the whole problem. If you actually treat your drivers like an asset instead of a commodity, you won't have a retention problem. So everybody that drives for me is a total asset to my company. They're not commodities. I don't get rid of them. I ex expend a lot of time, a lot of effort into training these drivers to be the best that they can. And one thing that I'm proud of, but I'm also just torqued off about is that 90% of the drivers that have ever driven for me have actually gone on and become their own owner operator. So they're very well trained and they're very well educated on how to actually run a business. You're not just a truck driver, you're a freaking business. Look at it as a business. Get rid of the driver mentality or what have you. But to retain a driver, you gotta make them understand they're part of your business and they're just, they're a huge asset. I can buy trucks all day long, right? I can't find drivers. And these puppy mill drivers that they're throwing out these days, <laughs> I don't think that I want any of those. Of course, you know, every squirrel gets a nut every now and then, right? So, but you know, on the puppy mill stuff that, that you see. But I always have um, different drivers come to me and the, Depending on how they run within, uh, what, what kind of trucking have they been in? What segment of trucking? Because I don't want to fix somebody else's issues. I would rather have somebody that's coming to me that's very well, doesn't know nothing. You know, they know how to operate a truck safely, but I want to train that driver to, to do what I actually want them to do. And then I make them feel part of my company because they are a huge part of my company. I don't have a retention problem. Jim. And, and I'm right along the same line, so I, I always figure with the expansion I've done, I've kind of must have done something right because we have zero turnover. So the same guys I started with are the same guys that are with me. Uh, my, my theory is that it comes down to respect, inclusion, and transparency. Um, I'm fully transparent with them. They know what these loads are paying because they're percentage-based drivers. And they see the same sheets I see. Respect. I mean, I, I share mutual respect with them probably because I'm still in my trucks. I still drive one. It's here in Pride and Polish. It's got bulls running down the side. You can't miss it. Um, and I drive that one every day, five days a week to Las Vegas, right alongside them. 
and I'm probably that guy that you know, you're going to have to yank me out of a truck one day. When I reach that point, I need to go in the office. I'm probably not going to want to get out of a truck because I've got that driver mentality like them. And respect is, is a big one. Just making sure, like Les said, you want to make sure they're not treated. You want to treat them like gold in, in these, this day and age. I've actually, uh, I figure I'm doing something right because I'm, I've got their friends. Everything in recruiting I've done has been word of mouth. This guy, is, we've known each other for a long time. He's told his cousin. He's told a friend, and they all want to drive with me. And the thing is, is I only want to expand as much as I feel I need to expand, not just to expand to expand. So uh, it, I, don't, I don't really have that problem. I have a zero turnover, which is a, a, you know, an anomaly for the industry. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. One, one thing adding to that, because I used to have owner operators and a company truck, yep. all them went on to have their own authority. They learned too much there, but that was all right. You know, I always wish people success on that. Um, what I always say, if you have a retainment problem, somewhere along the line, I have a ratio. The pay to pain ratio is off somewhere. I can put up with a lot, a lot of pain for enough pay, or vice versa. Somewhere that ratio is out of whack. The first part of your question was your retention, and what the second part of your question was what? Recruiting. Recruiting. Yeah. How do you attract? How do you attract drivers to your fleet? Man, use the drivers that you got. That's the best thing. You know. Yeah, word of mouth will get you farther than you know, and then it also helps you gauge what you're doing right. If you're doing it right, they're going to flock to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, a really interesting question because it's, you know, one thing when you're a hundred or a thousand truck fleet, recruiting is something totally different because you do have to be, you know, keeping that pipeline full. It's more of a sales process where really you guys with small fleets and trying to grow those fleets, it's really more culture management and you want to find the right person so you don't upset the boat because you bring somebody in that makes everybody angry, all of a sudden you got two, three empty trucks and <laughs> three quarters of your fleet is empty overnight and you're like, oh man, yeah, what you happened? got a mutiny on your hands, right? <laughs> exactly. Jimmy probably runs into this yet because I remember when I found all the people that were leased on to me and the drivers, I was still driving. Well, I still am, but you, you saw them at literally at the place of businesses where you were and they'd come up to you which for drivers anybody that's a driver you never know who's listening it was surprised me how many drivers i would come up to me and they'd start telling me about what they did to this company and what they did to that company and and all these things of how they got revenge back and then they'd say to me hey is your company hiring and i look at them i'm like i wouldn't let you pull my son's wagon to the mailbox after what you've just told me for the last half hour yeah, there's, you know, one thing I would throw out, we're, you know, tax and accounting company working with truck drivers, and for us, recruiting and retention is just as important with office type personnel as it is. We used to own a trucking fleet, and that's how we got into this business, and so it's, you know, it's always managing that culture. How do you treat your people? How do you manage your people? Do you treat them like an asset, like Les is saying? And, how do you do that? And, you know, we've been doing some management training within our own company, and one of the things we're trying to focus on is 95% of the people want to do the best thing that they can for the business every single day. But you have something negative happen within the business, and all of a sudden you always create all these policies because of that one little thing that happened. And so then you treat everybody that way. And it's, it's human nature to do that, that, you know, when you get kicked in the shins, you want to try and protect yourself from that happening again. But the reality is, always focus on the positive. Focus on the great things you've got going on and keep managing for that 95% who are trying to do the right things every single day. Don't worry about all the negatives. Always keep that forward momentum. Stay, stay focused on the positives and you'll attract the right people to your business. So does that help? What other questions? Over here, go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, in the title, Managing Cash Flow, um, I'd like to try to have you address managing fixed cost limits. We've got a lot of people coming into this industry who don't seem to understand fixed cost on a daily basis, what it does to them, the stress, people taking on 
thousand dollar a week payment. And I'd like you to kind of address what you think maybe some of the limits or what people could do to kind of gain a better perspective on what's a reasonable idea for an equipment or fixed cost to keep in line. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's a good question. It, but that's an easy question, so I'm going to let Henry answer that. <laughs> I'm going to pass it right over to Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can, uh, it, you know, it's interesting you asked that question because I was actually going to look at our updated number before this and did not have time to pull it out. Um, man, is Todd in well, here? Adding, on, like adding on his fixed cost, in reality, it yeah. all depends on your operation. His truck's different than mine. Right. Knowing your freight, I mean, it, I knew at the beginning, if you sit out a day waiting for freight, yep. you can't make that day up. It's gone forever. Yep. That happened to me back at the beginning. And this old timer was telling me how I needed to sit there three, four days like they were. I waited to the end of the first day and I said, this market isn't working. Yep. I was out of there. Yep. And when I saw him later that week, I'd hauled four more loads. He was just getting moving. Yep. Well, you can't make up those days. They're gone forever. You yeah. know, unless it happens to be at home or you're visiting family at the same time, you know, that you made it into a vacation, those days are gone. Yep. Well, but that's what you got to be mindful of, too. And so one of the things we're always coaching clients on is you got to know that fixed cost. You got to know what your break even point is every single day. And again, I apologize. I don't have that number off the top of my head right now. I can get the updated number. I don't want to give you. What was it? 130? 130 a day. There's Todd. Thank you. Because he just did the presentation on this. So 130 day is the average. But again, that's an average. You got to understand we're servicing tens of thousands of clients. We're servicing guys like Les. We're servicing guys like these. So that's an average across all owner operators, flatbed, expedited, all the different types of operations that are out there. So there are, you got to understand your fixed costs and how they affect your business, the niche that you're in, the customers that you're hauling with, what your load, to, load ratios look like, what your lanes look like, the seasonality, all those types of things. Do you want to take the month of January off? If you want to be able to do that every single year, that's a fixed cost. You got to figure into your business because like I said earlier, in this session, every night at midnight, your butt's gonna write a check, whether you're ready for it or not. And that's what those fixed costs are. They're the cost of time. And so you're gonna write that check, whether your truck's generating revenue, if it's parked at the TA, if it's parked next to the beach, whatever it's doing, you're writing that check every single night at midnight. If you don't know what those fixed costs are, you wanna take a vacation, and you don't have those fixed costs for your business paid before you take that vacation, you better rethink how you're going to use your time. I'm getting the, the signal that we're going to get yanked off the stage up here and wrap it up. Do we have time for another question, Max, or should we wrap it? Any more?